Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hello and welcome to the South Pacific Alliance podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. And before we get going, I, as always, want to say thank you to those churches who give to our district fair share. You make this possible for us to be able to uh, share uh, knowledge, information, ideas, um, encouragement, inspiration to everyone who listens. So thank you to the churches of the South Pacific District who, who help support all of the things the district is doing, not just this podcast, but church planting and next gen ministry and uh, church assessment and legal help. There's so many things that uh, the, the district fair share helps do, and this is just one of many. So thank you for giving. And we also want to thank our non sponsor, Aspire <laughs> yes. Healthy Energy Natural Drinks. <laughs> it's also true. We do want to. We do want to not thank them. Is that what you said? That's what we, we're th no, thank our non sponsor. Non sponsor. They thank our non sponsor. Us. It just uh, keeps me no awake. calories, no sugar, no taste. And today we are talking <laughs> about coaching and what coaching is, how it's different from uh, other types of learning relationships. And for this awesome topic, I have my friend Eric with a K Williams. Hello. Welcome, Eric. Well, thank you so much for having me, Michael. I'm super excited to be here. I'm really excited to be here. We've known each other for almost 10 years now, yeah. which is crazy. Uh, it's crazy. Man. I hadn't really thought about that until today and thinking about this intro, like, oh my gosh, we've known each other almost 10 years. Yeah. Um, and I invited you on because a year and a half ago, uh, we inadvertently went to a coaching certification program together. That's right. But we didn't know each other. I put you down as a reference. I remember to that. Get into that coaching certification program. Um, and then you said, what do you, do you want to go to Pittsburgh? Or so you texted me. Randomly. Yeah. Cause but, I had the, when I called, they said, I, uh, are you the Eric with a K that Michael Gilmore put down as a reference? I said, <laughs> I, I, I guess. <laughs> and he said, ask some information. I'm like, yeah, that's me. <laughs> so that's when I text him like, Hey, you want to go to Pittsburgh together? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, we, we I, I'm excited. We learned together and we learned, uh, and I, I'm excited to share with you what I learned and what Eric learned and what Eric's now currently doing in life uh, as a ministry coach. Yeah. Before we get there, I'd love for you to just introduce yourself and share some of your history of, of where you've been in ministry and, and what God's been doing through your journey. Yeah. So I have this May, which is when this airs, uh, I ha will have been in youth ministry for 30 years. Wow. And uh, and that doesn't include the seven years of camp ministry that I did prior to that, which was mm -hmm. when I was in high school and college, because uh, I worked every summer uh, of high school and college and then winter camps and, and fall retreats and all that stuff. Uh, that But that's where that's where I got, felt, or sensed my call to, to youth ministry. Actually, the director of camp told me, Eric, I believe God wants you to be a youth pastor. I'm like, great, what do they do? Because my <laughs> church was too small, we didn't have yeah. a youth pastor. I had met some that came to camp, but I had no idea what they do. They just work Sundays and, yeah. <laughs> and camp? Apparently that's not the case. Um, but then I did an internship as a, as a middle school pastor when I was a, a junior in college, and I was like, oh my goodness, this is what I was made for, this yeah. idea that I can be with students from week to week instead of waiting for those students to come back the next year and yeah. hoping they would come back the next year for camp. Uh, although I loved being intensely connected to those students that whole week, there was something about every week, week in and week out ministry. And I was, I was thrilled about this idea. And I had a great youth pastor that I interned under. And, uh, and then I started my first job uh, as a youth pastor two weeks after I graduated in Atlanta, Georgia area, and spent four years there. It was awesome training ground where I learned that uh, you really want to lean into your volunteers and not worry that you're overburdening them. Mm -hmm. This is funny, Michael. One of the things, I think you and I have talked about this in the past, but I was trying to do everything, mm -hmm. and I didn't want to overburden my volunteers. <laughs> and one of my volunteers, Mish, had said, hey, Eric, how about for for retreat, you let me take care of like all the details and registrations and and making sure we got vehicles. I'm like, well, why would you want to do that? That's that's a horrible part of ministry. She goes, I love that stuff. I go, you do? <laughs> I was so surprised that yeah. somebody would actually like something that I despise doing. Yeah. And that was like a huge gift for me and a, and a shift in how I started approaching ministry. Yeah. 
Um, and then I went to Oregon and I was a middle school pastor at Salem Alliance for eight years and continued to attend and volunteer at Salem Alliance for 10 more years after I went to the district office to be the next gen pastor or director and uh, worked with uh, about 100 churches in the district up there. Uh, coming alongside youth pastors, we ran a bunch of events that, like we do winter camp here. We did those kind of things, had some youth pastor retreats, kind of like the next, next conference. Um, and then I took some coaching courses at Western Seminary, hmm. and two or three of them, and I was like, it, it radically changed how I approached the relationships I had with these youth pastors, because it helped me to, to look at ministry differently and not just be the talker, which my, sure. is my natural thing, yeah. but ask questions. Yeah. A lot of us preachers are natural talkers. Yeah. So, and then uh, after I finished there, I came down to Southern California mm -hmm. and was at Southwest Church for five years. And that's and where we met. That's that where we met out in the Coachella Valley yep. area. And we would hang out at Starbucks quite a bit mm -hmm. over those years. And then uh, that was my first time outside of the Alliance since I was in third grade. Yeah, and uh, it, was, it was really interesting. And then. Uh, it was an EV free church, and then I did a Baptist church uh, in Rialto for three years until uh, we, I started sensing the Lord was doing some things in me yeah. and uh, and where I was at, and uh, and that's where we ended up doing the coaching course together. Yeah. Yeah. So, and here I am, and the rest is history. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. My actual first memory of you is from Life Conference when you hosted oh, yeah. in Louisville, right? Yep. Um, and you were on stage. And then when, like, when I find out that like you were down the road from me in the Coachella Valley, <laughs> I was like, wait, that guy. And so I was, That's funny. I was fresh in ministry. Yep. I, you know, I graduated in 2012 and started mm, later that year at Northgate in Palm and Cathedral city outside of Palm Springs. Um, and so for me, that was like these initial coaching relationship type things where mm -hmm. you weren't following me around every month, uh, checking in on what I'm doing and micro managing me, but you were there to support and encourage and yeah. um, give advice when I needed it. And so that was one of those um, opportunities that uh, coaching came into play. Yeah. And, and coaching is such a unique and special relationship. And, and I love it. Again, I, I don't want to go there quite yet. So I do also want you to share about your family yep. and uh, get, get to know them some too. Yeah. So Jeanne and I have been married 29 years this summer. Congratulations. And thank you. Thank you. And we met in college in a food fight. So that was fun. <laughs> and uh, and then we said, let's wait five years before we have kids. And uh, Kinsey came three days after our five-year anniversary. <laughs> and then- and Times I, that perfectly. <laughs> yeah. And then we're like, you know what? Once once we'd had, we, she'd been around for a little while. We're like, this is pretty great. Should we have another one? We're like, yeah, we should have another one. And Karsten came right away. Like literally <laughs> when we were ready to start having kids, they just came. Yeah. And then Karsten been with us for years. Like we're like, man, we got two kids. This is, this is awesome. We should have more, right? <laughs> just, we're, we both agreed. Yeah, let's have more. And then nothing, mm. bro, nothing. And I'm like, what's happening? <laughs> like yeah, they yeah. came immediately yeah. when we tried having kids and nothing was happening. And then I'll, I'll fast forward to the to December 26, 2004. Mm -hmm. There was a tsunami that hit Southeast Asia that just devastated Southeast mm. Asia. And I remember Jinan was, was, was watching uh, the news like, all the time and all these stories of families who are just decimated and kids who've got no no parents. And mm. so she said, have you ever thought about adoption? I'm like, nope. <laughs> and uh, I'll do the kind of the quick version of this because it, it's a, I love sharing, I love sharing the story. Mm. I just wasn't for adoption for us. I'm a fan of adoption. And I was like, I'm, I'm all for it for other people. But for us, I was like, it, it's not, it's not for us. Mm -hmm. And she kept asking every every six to 10 months, she'd bring it back up again. Have you thought any more about adoption? I'm like, no, I didn't think about adoption before. Why would I think it any more about it now? <laughs> Fast forward six years, she said, can we sit down and, and have a real conversation about this and talk about it? And, and uh, I was like, sure. And so we came with our pros and cons and my pro list was short and cons list was long and it was mostly financial and 
and our kids, Kinsey and Carson, were old enough to play outside for hours without us having to check on them and all that. And I'm like, I I just can't see going back to diapers and hmm. full dependency and all this stuff. And she goes, well, would you just be willing to pray about it? And I'm like, that's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> so I prayed and fasted three days and, and journaled, which I don't typically do. And and the Lord totally changed my heart. And I was like, I'm in and we're going to adopt two. And and uh, there's a whole bunch to the story, but um, we ended up adopting two kids from Ethiopia. They're two from two separate families. They're 16 days apart. Mm. Uh, we we went over to Ethiopia. We lived there for two months while we were in the process. Uh, it was about a year and a half long process, but uh, uh, and Kinsey and Carson get, got to come with us, mm. and then um, and then we after I think three weeks of visitation. We we got full custody of Naya and Hawk, and uh, but we couldn't go back to the states until everything was finalized with the the U.S. Embassy, and uh, they're in middle school now. And Kinsey's on the worship staff at Bayside Church, up in uh, northern central California, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. north of Sacramento, and Karsten is wrapping up his Thrive College, which is at Bayside Ministry School. So he's done four years of school and. And is looking to be a youth pastor. Um, so, and awesome. Hawk and I are sixth graders. And <laughs> yeah. my favorite category of people, because I did 12 out of my 30 years as a middle school pastor. Yeah. But boy, that's really different when they're your own. Yeah. They, I'm you, sure. You, you love everybody else's kid, but you want to kind of strangle your own <laughs> at times. But they are great kids. Yeah. So. Good. Wonderful. So you have some experience yep. under your belt, yep. uh, so to speak. That's awesome. Um, and we went out and learned about coaching. Yeah. And I'd love to start by defining coaching. Uh, how would you define coaching and how is it different than other types of learning relationships like a teacher or a mentor? Yeah. So I think coaching is best defined in comparison to other things. So mentoring or therapy, uh, we're just talking with a mom the other day about she's struggling with her son and and she's like you know we we've tried everything we're at the end and and uh i i talked about therapy she's like we've been to therapy and i'm like she's like and what is it you do with coaching what does that mean and i said well therapy counseling which i'm a huge fan of that typically looks at your past to help you move forward mm -hmm. where coaching differs in that coaching looks at what your dreams are, what the future is, to look forward. Yeah. So they're both the both end result is the same. They they want they both want to help you move forward, but they're they're working at different things. Coaching. I'm not a certified therapist. I'm not going to help you unpack your your baggage from when you were uh, traumatized as a kid because mm -hmm. that's that's not my specialty. Right. I can help pray with you on that. Right. But, and then mentoring, uh, where it differs in mentoring. Although there's a lot of kind of line crossing isn't, isn't the best way, but kind of blurred lines with, Fusion, with the youth yeah. ministry coaching uh, or ministry coaching. Mentoring is more like I'm going to come alongside you as a younger uh, person and I'm going to give you all of my advice yeah. and tell you here are some things you should do. Yeah. Where coaching I'm, is more I'm going to ask you questions and you're gonna get you're gonna come up with the agenda, like, hey, what's the best thing we could talk about today? Is a question yeah. I always ask. Yeah. Well, you know, and it could be, I, I want to lose ten pounds, or I am struggling with a volunteer, or the parents are bugging me in my ministry, or I just had this blow up with some students on our ministry, or we've got a fall retreat in two weeks, and yeah. I don't know what to do because yeah. I was supposed to do it with somebody else. <clears throat> so. Ministry coaching kind of comes alongside those and and puts them together. So I'll ask the questions. What do you want to talk about today? Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember when I was in Oregon, I had taken these coaching courses. And I had eleven. I ended up having eleven formal coaching relationships with youth pastors, and I would just ask questions. And occasionally they were like, "But I I just want you to tell me what I should do here." <laughs> yeah. And I would say, "Okay, let me take off my coaching hat and put on my mentor hat for a yeah. moment." Yeah. and give you my two cents. We're now having this ministry coaching more defined. It's like, it's those things combined. I'm gonna ask you to set the agenda because it's what, what you need for today or for this week. 
And then I'll ask questions and help you to kind of find some answers on your own, really just me asking questions. Yeah. And then <clears throat> occasionally it will be like, like I, I was working with a youth pastor and it wasn't two weeks, but it was like, hey, we usually do a retreat together with uh, another church. This is my first time ever doing it by myself and it's coming in six weeks. Mm -hmm. I don't know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And and he's been in ministry for a while, but he hasn't had to do all of that setup stuff. And so I said, okay, let's just work backwards. Yeah. What is your end result goal? Yeah. What do you want to happen as a result of students going? Okay, how many students are you hoping, would you want to see go? Okay, let's talk about that. How do we work towards that? So it's just kind of fun to, I'm still asking the questions and helping them kind of pull out some answers. But then occasionally I'm like, okay, let's whiteboard. And mo almost all my coaching is over Zoom. Yeah. Uh, so like, I'll have a whiteboard. Yeah. Like, okay, let's whiteboard <laughs> this. Let's talk about what do you want for the weekend? Okay. And like, I love games and program. Yeah. And this youth pastor, that's not his thing. He, yeah. He's way better at like articulating deep theology and he loves small group and all this stuff. And so he's like, I, I, I'm terrible at the games and programming stuff. Can you just give me some ideas? I'm like, yep. <laughs> so that's where I, and yeah. I, I really love that about the ministry coaching aspect. Yeah. Because I've been around for a while, mm -hmm. so I have some thoughts, mm -hmm. but I'm also learning all the time. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, the biggest takeaway for me about coaching is who the expert is in the conversation. Uh, as a coach, the person that your coachee is, you're considering to be the expert. Mm -hmm. They're the one with all the answers and a mentor relationship and a teaching relationship and almost any other learning relationship, we're learning from a person. Because uh, as my mentor, I want to be like you. I want to do the things that you've done. As a teacher, I want to gain the knowledge that you have. But as a coach, as a coachee, you are drawing the answers from their own creativity, their own expertise of the situation. And so having a lot of experience under your belt is great, but it doesn't really matter in the context of coaching whether you know what's going on or how to do what what they're doing or not, because you're the one asking questions, leading, guiding through questions. And the coachee is receiving guidance through their own thought processes, through their own reflection on the Holy Spirit and what God wants to do through their ministry. Yeah. And that's one of the most beautiful things that I love about coaching compared to all of those other things is I don't have to have the answer. Um, you do as the yep. coachee, you have to have the answer. You have to discover or find the answer if you don't have it. Um, and it was uh, almost a relief to me to kind of learn that because stepping into this role, I've done youth ministry. I'm pretty comfortable talking about youth ministry. I don't know a lot about kids ministry. I know some yeah. things, but I don't have to know everything about kids ministry or worship ministry or recovery ministry or men's or women's ministry uh, because the context is you're the expert. And let me ask some questions that maybe will help you discover the answers yeah. and discover what God wants to do through your ministry. And so I, I want to lay that foundation down as we continue this conversation because that's what we mean when we say coach. Yeah. When you we, we talk about coaching, it's not like, a, hey, I want to come tell you how to run your ministry. Which a lot of people look at coaching exactly. like that. Hey, can you go coach him through that process? Yeah, it's a, bu it's a buzzword right now. Yeah. And everyone loves coach because it sounds fun and unique and special. Um, but especially here at South Pacific Alliance, I've been very uh, emphatic about what coaching means. Yeah. And when we say the term coach, that's what we're talking about. Someone to come alongside you. I mean, literally think about a football coach. Um, it, it, Bill Belichick could not go out there and throw touchdown passes the way nope. Tom Brady did, but he knows what to happen. He knows to, how to tell Tom where to go with the ball, what might be a great opportunity on the field, but he can't do it himself. Yeah. He needs Tom Brady to do it. And he believes Tom Brady can do it. And Tom Brady did do it. He did. And uh, Although I still hold that Joe Montana's a goat. <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> uh, yeah. Rings aren't everything. Let's be That's honest. right. That's right. <laughs> um, so for me, when I get to sit down with a ministry worker or volunteer or anyone, I get to be that coach that believes in them mm -hmm. and says, you can go do this. How are you going to do it? Like where are your opportunities? Where where are your struggles? What are your obstacles? What are your what's working against you? What's working for you? I don't have to be the one out there to do it. I don't have to run your event, but I can help you 
succeed and and find the best opportunities possible. Yeah. And I love that role and I love coaching uh, in that sense. And so again, this is the foundation of coaching that we want to be talking about. Um, and uh, does, I mean, that, that makes sense to you. That makes sense yep. to me. Hopefully you as a listener, it makes sense to you as well. Um, so with that said, explain coaching, like what happens when you sit down with, with, a, with a, a person who's come to you and says, Eric, I, I need some help. I need some coaching. Um, what's the time frame? How, how much commitment yeah. is it? What's, what's, what's the whole process of coaching for you? So it's, it's really dependent on what the need is of the person that I'm coaching. So for instance, the, uh, the, co the youth pastors I'm currently coaching, um, most of them, one of, one of the youth pastors I'm coaching, when we first started coaching, it was as a result of kind of a crisis mm -hmm. time for him. And he we we met every week and it was we do one hour a week and again over zoom and in that coaching like i was just asking a ton of questions so the first first time it's like just get to know you and understand where you're at what your what your frame of reference is what your ministry looks like and and then going what is it that you hope to get out of this mm -hmm. coaching relationship so for him it was well I'm just I'm just in this place where if I don't work things out, I'm probably not going to be where I'm at anymore. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I said, okay, let's talk through that. That relationship is now we just crossed over a year long coaching relationship. Mm. I had and initially when I started doing this, I had like contracts and whatever, um, and I I think contracts are good. Yeah, they're 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 good to have, but but for me, I was like, okay, if you want to put a limit on, if you want to just do three months, great. Yeah. Let's let's <laughs> sign a contract for three months. We're going to do that. Yeah, uh, I signed a one year contract with another youth pastor because he his his lead pastor said he has a coach. He wanted him to get a coach, and he's like, and this was actually part of my my journey to stepping out on my own. He's the one who texted me after we and I, you and I had been yeah. in Pittsburgh. He texted me like two weeks after that. Do you by any chance do any youth ministry coaching? And I'm like, I start crying because I'm like, okay, the <laughs> Lord is really just affirming that this is the direction I'm heading at. I'm like, yeah, actually, I'm in yeah. this program right now. And um, so it it's it's totally dependent on the person. I have another coach that or another youth pastor that I coached that initially when we talked about finances, even, and she's in Alaska, it was like it didn't sound like that was gonna work. And I remember wrestling with this and I was laying in bed thinking about, it. I'm like, you know what? It's Alaska. I don't know. Is it financial stuff? Okay. And I felt like the Lord was saying, just say, this was like October or something like that. And I said, so I said, hey, how about we do free coaching for, uh, and this probably isn't really good for me to say on here either, but <laughs> how about we do free coaching until the end of the year, so like three months or whatever. Sure. And my wife was like, why do you keep doing that? <laughs> That's not financially, you know, it's not business savvy. I'm like, I'm a terrible business person. Yeah. But um, at, once we came, once we crossed to the end of the year, all of a sudden it's like, hey, I've talked to my pastor. I want to continue this on because mm -hmm. this has been really beneficial. Mm -hmm. And it's, it, so it's really dependent. Yeah. It, I can see like one of the things we talked about when we were at our coaching uh, kind of training event, uh, we talked about having, sometimes it could be like a once a month touch, touch up, mm -hmm. like after you do a more intense set. Mm -hmm. I have a friend who does uh, 12 week coaching commitments or 12 mm -hmm. session coaching commitments. And mm -hmm. it's, it could be every week or it could be every other week, but they commit to 12 sessions. Um, but again, totally dependent on the person and the need. Yeah, absolutely. And I've experienced that too, having come back from there and had the opportunity to coach some. Uh, one coaching relationship I had was uh, in the lead up to Life Conference. They had never organized a trip 
like that before. So we would meet every other week and do check marks. So like, what are you working on? What's what's in the way? What kind of fundraising are you doing? Um, and walk through those steps of like, all right, where are you at? Um, and then again, after that, they're like, yeah, one month checks in. Let's just keep it keep it rolling. Um, and the, the coach can be for a season of time um, stepping into this role at the district. Uh, I had a coach myself uh, and it was timely for that transition to uh, talk through, okay, what do I need to do to be prepared for this new role, for this new job? Um, and it was really helpful to have someone to talk to and uh, especially as an outside voice. Um, obviously, yes. I've got great bosses and great coworkers and a great wife, um, but they also don't necessarily know how to support um, my brain in mm -hmm. working through those processes. And, and a great coach will understand you and will be able to know, okay, so he has the details down, but he doesn't know what he needs to do. Yeah. So let's work towards a, a step, an action step. Or they know what they need to do. They don't know how to get there. So let's work on some details. Or they know what they need to do and they don't know how to get there, but they don't know who's going to help them along the way. And all three of those pieces are really important to moving forward. Mm -hmm. Just like we talked about in you know, that kind of therapy versus coaching. Like you're looking to the future. Where do you want to be? And how can we help you get there? How yeah. can we help yourself get there and accomplish the things that are on your heart or on your mind and or God has put placed on your mind and heart? Um, so yeah, let me ask you this, what maybe some people out there have experienced coaching of one form or another, or something that they were told was coaching. Mm -hmm. Um, how would you define a good coach? What, what makes a good coach or a good coaching session? I, I think, so one of the questions I ask at the end of every coaching session or most coaching sessions is, was today's conversation beneficial to you? Mm-hmm. And that question comes after uh, the uh, another question I ask is what are okay so define your steps that you're going to take between now and the next time we meet yeah because I always ask very specifics okay this is a step you're going to take when are you going to take it yeah and what what are you going to do what are the things you need to do to get there whatever uh, so the the coaching coaching sessions are. The, uh, it's important for those sessions to, for you to come out of that feeling like, okay, this conversation was beneficial for me. It helped me moving forward. Now, I, I'm not going to be mad at you if you don't follow through on the things that you said you were going to do, right. but I am going to bring up accountability and ask you the questions the next time. And that's one of the things I really like about coaching is if the person I'm coaching doesn't do the things that they said they were going to do, I don't lose sleep over that yeah. because it's it's not my decisions. Yeah, It's the person I'm coaching going, okay, so you didn't accomplish that. Do you want to talk about that? And I, I, I ask how much accountability they want. Because mm -hmm. one, the, one of the people I was coaching recently, um, I because I always take notes and then I look at the notes before we meet again. And I, I ask the question, okay, hey, you said you were going to do this. Tell me about that. Yeah. Thank you for asking because <laughs> other people don't ask me yeah. unless it's crisis mode. Yeah. Well, didn't you say you were going to do that? And it's like supervisors getting upset where I take the notes, I ask the questions and if they accomplished it, awesome. I'm going to cheer yeah. them on. Yeah. If they didn't accomplish it, okay, talk about that. Do you, do you want to talk about why you didn't follow through that? No, what it, this, I've got something more pressing yeah. and it probably actually, uh, helps me you to understand why I didn't accomplish what I okay let's talk about that so I think I think coming back to your question which I may have forgotten exactly what it was so one, <laughs> what what makes a good coach or okay a good yeah. coaching session so I think you coming out of a session going I feel like I have some defined steps to take yeah and feeling like it was beneficial the conversation was beneficial one of the things you said Michael I really appreciated I think is really true is an outside voice yeah that has no, in yeah. a sense, skin in the game yeah. to your very specific, unique uh, scenario. And because the people that are right around you can often be too deep into it that they can't yep. champion the way you need someone from the sidelines to yeah. champion. Even for perspective of like, if they're in this hole that they need to figure a way out of, yep. maybe they don't understand that there's a rock up here you can tie a rope to, to get out of. Yeah. Um, but they're just, they're 
trying to claw out or whatever. I mean, this is a pretty dire metaphor, but <laughs> um, that sense of that uh, you're not in the weeds with them and you can be creative. And maybe they have thought of the solutions that you throw out there and it doesn't work out. That's fine. Um, but as a coach, as a third party, there's uh, a new perspective that you can bring to the table, uh, which I think a good coach will break down situations, make them smaller. Yeah. Yep. Um, and there's so much to do in ministry in particular and in life. And uh, a good coach can pull you back and say, okay, does that matter? Uh, does what, what matters here? And what can, what do you control right now? What can you do right now? Um, I think a coach, a good coach will always leave you on an action step. Mm -hmm. um, not a, you know, life plan, one action step. What's one thing you can do? Maybe two or three at most. But like we're talking about realistic goals. We're talking about realistic steps. And a good coach won't leave you hanging, but will encourage you to make that commitment to a step and hold you to it. Um, not even hold you to it, but be there to respond and yeah. say, make sure you're following through. And if you don't, if you don't want to follow through, if you change your mind, that's great. Like, I love that about being a coach is like, all right, if that doesn't work, that's fine. Like, I, like no skin in the game, mm -hmm. that type of thing. And so, yeah, I definitely agree with everything you're saying here, but, and I should say not, but, but, and a good coach breaks things down yeah. uh, and simplifies the process. I, I, I know that when I was in youth ministry, that I would so get so overwhelmed. I'm a oh, thinker. Yeah. I love the details. I, I want everything to be perfect. And many, I'm sure many of our listeners like to have things perfectly organized and controlled because that's human nature. Um, but when I started working with coaches and learning about coaching, uh, the coach that I, that I had last year, um, he was very not me. He was very <laughs> red. He was an eight. He was a challenger. Um, if you're an SDI, he was very red and he would just say what he thinks. And I would come into a session saying like, well, I really got to talk about this because this and this and this and this and this and that. And he says, so? doesn't matter. Let it go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but you don't understand Okay. Me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll just, I'll just let it go. <laughs> and like just saying something simple like yeah. that from the outside perspective can uh, change your whole heart and outlook on a week, a month, uh, a season in ministry um, and help you move forward. And, and that's, I think, the goal of a coach is helping people move forward, breaking it down, keeping them accountable, keeping them working. Um, and that's hard to do without someone alongside you encouraging you and inspiring you yeah I, I, what you what were you saying there michael i triggered something the the what if you've ever visited another church you immediately see oh that's a great idea mm -hmm. oh where's the signage how do i <laughs> why why is there nobody welcoming me or greeting me or how can they do this and you like you you have i we can tend to have like not critical like bad but we critique things. And I, lo I, I, uh, I loved, I worked with this guy, Jeff Gonzalez, who was an executive pastor at one of the churches I worked at for a while. And, and he took a team of, of uh, our staff to like three or four different churches. And he just said, let's evaluate each church that we go to. What do you see? What's good? What would you change? What did you miss? Yeah. And, you know, they talk about the f people make a decision about the church in their first 30 seconds. And I'm like, well, I don't know how you, how you measure that, but mm -hmm. the first 30 seconds is pulling into the parking lot. Yeah. I remember being in Orlando, we were visiting a church and we're asking some, some questions. This was kind of, most churches weren't open, but this was in Florida. So they were open a, a quite a bit before us. And, and we just went there to, to visit with some, some pastors and youth pastors and, and ask them the process of reopening and all this. And we pulled into the church parking lot and there was people waving they had signs or, or shirts that were all matching mm -hmm. and we rolled down the window because they were they're directing traffic for where we were to park and they said is this your first time with us we're like yeah okay you've got a special parking spot right over here they had a whole whole visitor parking spot for first time guests and then there was somebody that was in like this cover tent right there who knew because we're parking there they know we're first time guests they came over with a little map to hand us, to show us where everything was, asked us if we had any questions. And we're like, yeah, we're supposed to meet the youth pastor. Okay, he's gonna be over here. This is the area in the building that he's gonna be at. Uh, and if you'd like, I'll walk you over there. I'm like, 
It was awesome. I'm like, I want to, I don't even know if their preaching is any good, <laughs> but I want to be yeah. part of that church because I felt so welcome. Yeah. So in the same, same way, uh, in coaching, as a coach, we get to have a different perspective. Like you were saying, your coach was like, why are you worrying about that? Yeah. You, you're, you're so entrenched in what it is, whatever that thing was, he's going, stop worrying about that. Just yeah. let it go. Yeah. Now, he's very different than you are. I know him. And he's very different than you are <laughs> and different to me in many ways where I kind of have a harder time to let go of some things. But that perspective of going in the grand scheme of things, that's so minor. Yeah. Look at what you have. Yeah. To be able to see a different perspective. And I, you know, I encourage you, if you haven't been to a church outside of your own church in a while, go do it and learn some things from what they're doing right and what they're doing I wouldn't say wrong, but what you would what you would change, yeah, to give you some insight just for ministry, but also on the idea of coaching. I think it's yeah. a really good idea. Yeah, and here's here's the reality that I would believe is that um, Satan wants to distract you. Mm -hmm. He wants to pull you away. He wants to put doubt in your mind that you're not the right person, that you're not the right place, that you have the right skills, that you have the right resources, um, but. And you can agree or disagree with this, but I would believe that every person is in their ministry for a reason, and God has a plan for that ministry, and He has a totally reason. disagree. Uh, I knew it, <laughs> and He has a reason that He's put the particular people in those ministries. Yeah, and a coach, a good coach, will believe that, understand that, and is working to bring about God's will for that ministry, mm -hmm. and work against what Satan is 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 work doing in those doubts and those fears. And to inspire confidence, and uh, that a good coach understands those things, and, and a good coach should be encouraging you to embrace the gifts that God has given you, yeah. working within the context that God has given you and the resources you have. Amazing ministry can happen regardless of how much money you have or don't have, or space you have or don't have, or people that you have or yeah. don't have. And I think oftentimes we all look to those super churches that have it all figured out and say, oh, if I could do that, we well, can't do all of that, but maybe you could do some of that. Yeah. Maybe you can start moving towards that, those things that that inspire you and encourage you. And um, we coaches are, are there to help bring out the reality of what God wants to happen in your ministry. Yeah. So I'd love to hear if you have any stories of coaching and how it's transformed people's lives or how they've been different. And I'll, and I'll start, uh, give you a moment to think, um, because we have uh, had a pastor in our district who uh, was struggling for, for a season and, and the ministry was just not going the right direction. Um, and it was, it was really hard to see because it was once very thriving, very successful, but um, we, we saw the, 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 the signs that like, okay, this is not going in the right direction. Um, but more than anything to me, they just seemed tired and they seemed overwhelmed and they seemed just out of their, their depth. And um, we at the district came alongside them and we, we hired a coach for them to work with them. Um, and we went back and visited that church, uh, just a few months ago. It was almost a year, uh, since I had seen them and was in this, I saw them in this place of like, man, this is something's got to change here or this church is going to die. Or at least this person is not going to be at this church anymore. But after a year of coaching, which one, one, once a month check-in, he was a different person. And, and I, I sat in on this meeting uh, with him and his leaders, and it was this whole different, it was a, like a different person from the year before. And I walked away from that saying, like, coaching made such a difference. And it's such a small commitment to say, I want the best for my life and my ministry, and I want someone to come alongside and speak into that. After that meeting, I went up to him and I said, you're a different person than a year ago. And I'm so proud of you. Like I didn't think, uh, to be honest, I didn't think you could do this last year, but but this year, I know you can do this. Like I see the the transformation, the, your pursuit of God, your faithfulness in this is totally different because of this past year, and not a lot has changed in the context of that ministry, but the trajectory and the the confidence that he had in himself changed drastically. 
The numbers around them didn't change much, but it was a stark difference to who he was a year before. And I attribute that to coaching. Someone coming alongside him and saying, you can't do this. God is giving you vision. He's giving you direction and uh, helping them embrace what God is doing. It's so easy for us as human beings to doubt ourselves, to doubt what we're hearing from God, to doubt what we read in scripture. And um, I think a good coach just encourages you in the things you're already doing and reiterates, God loves you. God put you there for a reason. God's going to do great things. Just walk in faithfulness, pursue him and see what he does. And I, I, I just, I want to put that on recording on camera and say, coaching matters. And I've seen yeah. it make a huge difference, even in just one life. But, uh, do you have any stories you want to share? Yeah. You know, one of the, one of the words you said, Michael, I thought was so good. It was confidence. Mm. And that's something I've seen through coaching is a significant word because most of the people that I've coached confidence has become, and, and not like I, I, not everybody is like, has a lack of confidence that I'm coaching. Some of it's, but I, I think of the one youth pastor who came out of, and I'm, I'm trying to be slightly vague because I don't want to, I don't want to uh, break any confidence because in coaching, I'm always like, look, what, what we talk about, I'm not going to go talk to your lead pastor yeah. unless there's, for some reason we have a setup where like the lead pastor and you and I, we all meet and going, okay, this is what we're going to do. But there's still going to be things that are going to be confidential, right? Uh, you know, because I, I I do remember when I was taking coaching courses, they talked about sometimes it comes as a result of a supervisor, and you do a check in with a supervisor, but it's not saying here's all the things the person that I'm coaching is saying. Mm -hmm. Here's where I've seen them grow. That's the kind of stuff I mm -hmm. I would share. So, mm -hmm. but confidence was is a big deal. So the, this one youth pastor that I've been coaching coming out of this crisis space and wondering is ministry even where I should be and having some pretty significant transitions within his church context and all that stuff, walking through him, walking through that with him has been so significant and I've seen him grow in his confidence. Yeah, And that's, I don't say it's because of me, I yeah. say it's because of coaching. Yeah. And again, mostly what I do is ask questions. Yeah. Right. And there's, we all have, I think we all have answers inside of us. Yeah. Again, sometimes there's like, I just don't know the answer. Just give it to me. Yeah. You know, okay, well, let's talk about something like, right, in ministry. But, uh, and then an, another one I would say, uh, this one youth pastor has been frustrated with a couple situations with, people that they work with and uh, some volunteers and coming out on the other end of on, on this specific uh, conversation, we, we probably had three coaching sessions on that. Um, each one, here's a step or two that they chose to take forward on that. Okay. I'm not done with this thing. So can we talk about it again this week? Yep, absolutely. So two or three of those conversations and then hearing the reports after a coaching session that on the next coaching session, hey, how did it go? Hearing this being said, thank you so much for asking me these questions because that relationship that I thought was going to be burned because of the things you helped me to process through, it's actually better than it was before. Yeah. And that, I go, oh, Thank you, Jesus, that I have the opportunity to get to do this. And, I, you know, in my years of ministry, mostly that's been with students having those kind of conversations, right? So it's, it's been really great to have that type of relationship with some youth pastors. You know, that was that was me and you sitting, yeah. and ours was not formal, no. and we didn't call it coaching or anything. It was just sitting at Starbucks and... I'd ask questions, you had questions, and yeah. talk about the ministry and what are you doing and what am I doing and all and that. Pray, yeah. yeah. And but I saw over the years, Michael, like because you and I are very different, so we have different ideas. Mm -hmm. So seeing you go, you know, I, I remember you and your dad came over to pick up the bubble soccer because yeah. we had a whole bunch of bubble soccer yeah. things, and and that was just like 
because of our relationship, you, I, we, you're talking about an event you want to do. And I'm like, you can totally borrow those. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. And just being able to hear like afterwards, this event was so awesome. And this is what we used it for. I think you ended up using it for two events. Yes. Yeah. And like for me, you know, that was just a thing that, that I could quote unquote equip you with. Yeah. Uh, but what that did was for you, your event was, your two events were successful and not, it wasn't just the bubble soccer, but that yeah. was a piece to it for you to come out of that going, that was really good. I just remember how excited you were about those. And that's the same thing with coaching of when someone just gets excited because they had a breakthrough or they were able to, to make a decision. And that's with this one coach just going, I made so much progress in these few relationships and like Karen, thank you for asking me that question. I hadn't even thought about mm -hmm, that. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I, again, you said you said some. You alluded to this earlier. That comes as a result of one of the things we learned was while we're in the coaching, listen to them, but also yeah. be listening to the Holy Spirit. Yeah, yeah. A good coach is not preparing what they're going to say. They're listening. Yeah, and actively listening and trying to read between those lines. Um, and if, as once I learned formally what coaching was, I started to reflect, man, there's a lot of things I learned that are actually coaching, you know, back in college, like I took these classes or oftentimes I would be, um, talking with our chaplain at crown and he, he taught me a lot just by who he was, but, um, he was coaching me and, and, and the, just the realization of like, man, coaching is so effective and so simple, even what, Bill Kuhn, um, Dr. Bill Kuhn, the, our chaplain at Crown College, what he taught me is, is his most effective strategy was simply parroting. Uh, he would just listen and then he would hear one word. So it'd be like, yeah, you know, I'm, um, I'm enjoying my semester, but it's been a little, uh, a little bit of a struggle to do uh, all my studies or whatever. Struggle. What, what, what are you struggling with? Oh yeah. You know, just, uh, really been hard to balance everything. What are you trying to balance? You know, pick yeah. one word and yep. d dive deeper, 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 dig just a little bit. And, um, all the truth comes from the one answering the questions. Um, not like, it's not like Bill came up, uh, Bill Kuna would be like, well, well, you just gotta, you gotta schedule your days out differently. Yeah. You know, he, he said, well, what are you trying to balance? And what's sometimes important? like college students for sure, but sometimes we don't think about that deep yeah. until somebody asks us the questions. I hadn't thought about that. I exactly. love that light bulb moment. Yeah, absolutely. So let me ask you this. What aspect of prayer is involved in coaching? Yeah, so there's a lot. Uh, for sure, praying before a coaching session. Every coaching session, I, you know, I, 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 I share with you, I ask a couple questions. What are your steps? Let's, let's break down the things we talked about today. That, mm -hmm. And sometimes they're not sure. So I go, okay, I took notes. Here's what I heard you say. Yeah. And I just want to make sure that this is what you're saying. So they, we, we've got the steps. And then I, I'll ask, you know, was, was today's session helpful to you? Mm -hmm. And then I say, okay, before we schedule our next session, what's, what's the most important thing I can be praying for you over the next two weeks mm -hmm. or b before our next session? Yeah. And th for me, because I take notes, I'll come back to those notes and it will be a reminder for me to pray because if we don't, <laughs> if we don't pray in the moment, like we all have the best intentions of praying yeah. for people, right? Yeah. Stephen Curtis Chapman had a song years ago. I come back to it often and it's, I think it's called Let Us Pray. But he's like, let us pray, let us pray everywhere in every way, every moment of the day, it is the right time. Amen. And he talks about how when we finish, we should start again. Yeah. And then in a, one of the verses, he talks about how he's talking to someone and then says, I'll pray for you with good intention but then ends up forgetting. Mm. So like for me, it's just important. I do this in a lot of conversations I have when I, I'll just ask, how can I pray for you today? Yeah. And then you've been, you, we've done yeah. this, right? Yeah. In that moment, I'm gonna pray there. Yeah. Instead of saying, unless it's like, I know you have to go and I'm going, but here's what I'm gonna commit to. Yeah. On my drive back to my house, yep. I'm gonna pray for you. Yeah, be intentional, be, yeah. be focused and, um, intentionality is a great word for a coach yeah. uh, because they're helping you move forward with intention, with purpose, 
in step with the spirit and um, inviting them into that. And yeah, I think prayer is, is so important in all this process because that's how we uh, become honed in to hearing from the spirit. It's how we, you know, express ourselves back to God, expressing those frustrations. Um, but uh, it's easy to try to do it in our own strength and, and saying like, well, I just need the three-step process. Just tell me how to do it yeah. and I'll do it. <laughs> yeah. Why well, don't want to tell you how to do it? I want you to pray. I want you to hear how God wants you to do this event. I want and and a good coach will help you understand how to connect with the Lord mm -hmm. in whatever you're doing in ministry. Uh, how to connect it to the broader uh, mission of your church, or or other, or how to partner with other churches to make this something even more special. I mean, we're all praying to that same God with that same Spirit, and when we turn to Him, He's going to help guide and design that path forward for your ministry and your church to be a, the most effective piece of ministry that it can be. Yeah. Um, so that's huge. You know, Michael, there, there's a, um, one of the things I enjoy is again, through that active listening and listening to the Holy spirit is when someone's talking about something that I might not have expertise in or whatever, or I know of a resource being able to to share a resource with somebody like that one of the things uh oh, I just blanked on the guy's name but uh there's a there's a book called Sacred Pathways and I I want to say that there's 9 or 11 pathways that he talks about of how people connect to God based on their personality and 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 all that stuff and you take an assessment and then you kind of get here's which you're most likely and you talked about red and you talked about eight so you, you just mm -hmm. there was a different personality assessments yeah. And I love, I'm a huge fan of those assessments because it helps me understand who I am, yeah. who you are, how I can better to relate to you, especially if, you know, whether it's somebody that's working, I'm working with, or it's volunteers or whatever. But what this sacred pathway came as a result, like in, in this one conversation I had with, with the youth pastors coaching, because they're like, I just, I'm just trying to find better ways to connect with God. Mm. And so I asked some questions that came out of sacred pathway and, and I, I had an idea, but I said, let me send you this assessment. And then it gives you some, I don't have the book, but I'll give you the assessment. And it gives you like, here's, here's a, a little bit about what each one of those pathways is about. Like, so for instance, one of them is the naturist. So, which is one of my top ones. Like I connect with God in nature. Yeah. I used to, I, I thought it was the dumbest thing when I heard on uh, point break when, <laughs> when, Bodhi, I think was a guy's name, <laughs> said that surfing is a spiritual experience. And I'm like, and he's like the total bad guy, but it was all about like, it was a very spiritual experience. And and then I went surfing <laughs> and I started to surf and now I love surfing. And he's actually right. It's a <laughs> spiritual experience. And for me, it was like floating on the water, looking at the beach. And, and you know, when I first started, it was in Oregon and seeing seeing like the the cliffs on the mm. edge of the beach mm -hmm. and and the sun coming down like seeing sea otters jumping in front of me <laughs> and I'll some other time maybe I'll share about the time that I paddled out by three killer whales wow. which was not really smart I was within wow. 100 feet because it was so amazing and <laughs> for me that experience was like I was connected to the Lord because God created these creatures yeah. who were spouting up and it was and I'm float it was just awesome. So, but in there it talks about, okay, so if naturist is your thing, take your Bible and go for a walk in the woods. Yeah. Or do a do a prayer walk. Yeah. Or like some people, it's aesthetics. And so maybe it's going into a more, uh, like a, a lot of Catholic churches have stained glass windows. And some, mm -hmm. some of our churches I think do too. But finding something, some place that's aesthetically pleasing. Sure. There's a connection to God. So coming back to what you were saying earlier, Michael, that was for me, it was like, I sensed that and I remember that the Lord prompted me with that, that tool. And that was really helpful for this person I was coaching to go, okay, I'm going to connect God in a way that's best for me. Yeah. And maybe not the way I was told I have to do this, you know, I got to find my space in the morning at 6 a.m. and spend, sure. you know, it's not a formula. Yeah. For some, the formula works because that's how they're shaped and designed. Yeah. But 
really that it, and that comes through prayer and i'm so thankful for the lord of prompting those moments yeah. because i see the result of it yeah it's super cool god is so amazing and so creative and each and every one of us is unique and special and he's designed us differently and what again another thing that i love about coaching in particular is because it's a journey of self-discovery mm -hmm. for the coachee and and we're trying to discover what how has god made you in particular and it's a personal learning experience a personal growth experience because you're not coming to me for all the answers i can tell you how to be michael gilmore i cannot tell you how to be eric with a k williams yeah. and uh, only god can tell you how he's made you and um, that's one of the very special things that I've experienced in coaching um, as a coachee and a coacher. Um, and it's something that I, I hope more people can discover because when you start to understand yourself better, um, you can do ministry better and more naturally because you're working in your gifts and your abilities rather than trying to do all of the planning and spreadsheets yeah. for the vans uh, for camp that you hate and despise. <laughs> um, and you can discover that you despise it and find a way to uh, delegate it and, and be more successful yeah. in ministry. Who would you say should be coached? Who needs a coach? Yeah. I'm so glad you asked that question. What I loved, so you guys are listening, you're sitting there going, what, what's the script they're working off of? You, we didn't, we talked that, that we we're going to talk about coaching. <laughs> yeah. Cause I, when I walked in, I was like, what are we talking about today? Coaching. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. That's right. We were talking about coaching cause yeah. I kind of forgotten and, and, uh, but you know, there wasn't a specific plan, but the person who needs to be coached is not just the person in crisis. Yes. I think everybody should have a coach. Yep. Honestly, because Again, coming back to the question you asked earlier, what does a good coach do? It helps us to move forward. Yeah. And everybody needs to move forward. Yeah. Right? So again, the timeline of how long you need coaching, that's different for everybody. Yeah. Maybe it's coaching through a certain situation or it's coaching to elevate your, I don't I don't like the word performance per se, but how do you, how do you get to be better at what you're doing? Yeah. Um, Again, I don't have to be the expert. I could coach the the president of Coca Cola, yeah, which would be super cool, yeah, right. I don't know anything about running a business like that, but I can ask questions. Yep. And anybody, I think we all need someone who's asking us questions, yeah, and helping us to to not get so stuck in in what's right in front of us. Yeah, you know, it's kind of like middle schoolers. Uh, our, when I was at Southwest, the ministry, and we did this in, in Salem as well, ministry was called Crash. It was middle school ministry. Crash is what a herd of rhinos is called. Mm -hmm. And it's called a crash of rhinos. And the reason we did that was rhinos can only see about 30 feet in front of them. And I can't remember how fast they can run, 30 miles an hour or whatever, but it's mm. much faster than what their eyesight <laughs> vision has the ability, which is very much like a middle schooler. Yeah. <laughs> can't see very far in yeah. front of them, runs really fast. Oh, and also a crash of rhinos can cause great destruction and yeah. soak in a bunch of middle schoolers, yep. right? Accurate. So th this idea of, of what they do, like we all need to be able to see past right in front of us to make forward movement. And having someone help us take those steps is really, really helpful. Yeah. I think of the times of the coaches in my life who just asked me questions and I go, oh, that just actually unplugged something for me yeah. and set me free because I hadn't th either thought about it or I was worrying so much about something else that was a blockade. And the questions became like these removing the obstacles in a sense. Not that those problems wouldn't be there, but it helped me to look at it differently. So I would say... We all need coaches. Absolutely. Yeah. Leaders are learners. And if you stop learning, you probably should stop leading Yeah, because <laughs> uh, things are constantly changing. And if you're not continuing to grow, you're not going to be able to serve the people that are following you um, and to the best of your abilities. And there a few years ago, uh, certainly at Northgate, we worked through this process of like uh, with the terminology incline, recline, and uh, Decline, 
Yeah, there's it's a one one of the clients. One of the clients. Um, yeah, incline, recline, and decline uh, yeah. all the way. So are, is your ministry growing? Is it on the up? Is it on the incline? Or are you plateaued and reclining? Or are you going downwards? And when we stop learning, growing, challenging ourselves, that decline comes a lot faster. And you can't always constantly be going up, up, up. But yeah. um, there are seasons that we need to be challenged and we need people to come alongside us and encourage us. So wherever you are in ministry, whether you're starting out, whether you're in crisis, whether you're a long seasoned veteran, whether you just uh, finished a tough season, maybe you need a coach uh, uh, to help you rest. Yeah. Maybe a coach, you need a coach to come alongside you and make sure that um, you're finding time to rest in Jesus. Uh, maybe you are going in a, into a tough season, but a coach just comes alongside, su- supports and amplifies everything that you're already doing in ministry um, because that's all they're doing is they're saying you can do it and, and God wants you to do it. So let's do it. Um, what do you need to do? And uh it's, it's amazing. And so, yeah, I agree. Anyone, everyone needs a coach. Um, you don't have to be fresh in ministry or uh, maybe uh, sometimes it, it does happen in crisis where it's like, this is the last straw. So last ditch effort, Miguel, let's go learn from someone else, I guess. It's okay to admit that you don't know everything. Yeah. We don't. We don't know everything. So you might as well start off on the right foot and um, get some help along the way. Anything else, anything that stands out to you about coaching that we, we, we skirted over, you want to go back to or haven't mentioned yet? Um, you know, I was just thinking the, maybe it's a more of a recap, but I, I believe, again, you can't, you can't have enough coaching in your life. Yeah. Because there's someone who's asking you questions that it's an outside perspective. And I, you can coach inside. I, I'm currently coaching a church through a transition they've actually asked me for two years. Yeah. And uh, that's a that's a whole other story where they moved buildings and their youth pastor left of 14 years and and the worship pastor ended up having to leave. And you know, all this, all these things came. They're like, can you coach us through this season and focus on the next gen? And so we we've got a part-time kids director, a part-time youth director, and I meet with both of them one-on-one every week. Mm-hmm. And I ask a lot of questions. Mm-hmm. Now that situation I'm a little more involved in because of the the arrangement we have, and I preach there, you know, every every four to six weeks or so. Yeah. Um, but the questions I sit with the kids and the youth director, I, it's I'm just helping them to to see, and sometimes they can get overwhelmed, cause, especially because they're part time. Yeah. Like I don't have time to do all this stuff. Okay. Let's process through what it is you need to do. Yeah. Again, I'm not a detail guy, but I've yeah. done it for 30 years, so I can I know that we have to do the details, but I can ask you questions about the details yeah. for you to figure those things out. Yeah. And even help you if if that's if you're more like me and I've got tips and tools and tricks that I use to be more productive and and things that when I was younger I never would have thought of. Yeah. And so I just think that it's such a valuable, valuable thing to be a part of that you can't, you can't but win with having a coach in your life. Absolutely. I agree. And I hope that uh, everyone who is listening uh, understands the, the impact that a coach can have and um, the relationship opportunity that a coach can be for them. And I want to give just a couple of shout outs. Maybe you are listening to this podcast and say, I love the sound of that. I want to be a coach myself. Uh, we went through a program from the youth cartel called the youth cartel coaching certification program. Uh, shout out to them, to Marco Stryker and Brian Wallace, yep. who uh, taught us all a lot of our, our knowledge and uh, formality in our coaching. And um, they have uh opportunities for you. You can find out more at the youth cartel.com and, uh, is it .org.com? I don't know. Nah. Just Google youth cartel. And then the top link there is probably the right one. Uh, but go, f- go find out how to become a coach. And, if there's and guns on training. the page, don't go there. That's a different, that's cartel. the wrong cartel. That's uh, <laughs> definitely, um, and make sure you get yeah, spell all of youth and yeah, yeah out there. Uh, so, uh, Wonderful program. I, I learned so much yeah. in that two and a half days. And so maybe you're saying, hey, I want to be a coach myself. 
go check it out. Go find out more. Uh, and if you've been in ministry for a season and you want to give back, or maybe you're just really good at asking questions, uh, this is for you. And, and I'd love to see more people coaching in this style. Um, and the more people that can do it, the more we can encourage and support one another. Um, but other than that, we have uh, lots of opportunities for coaching. And I know coaching can be expensive if you go to outside firms. I mean, corporations pay thousands, thousands yeah. hundreds of thousands of dollars for these incredibly professional corporate coaches. Um, Which would be awesome if there's any corporations yes. out there looking for somebody to spend thousands yes. and thousands of dollars. Uh, on Eric in particular, <laughs> um, please let us know. But um, we, we in ministry, the, the idea of coaching is, I feel like just really gaining popularity and steam and uh, ministry coaches are starting to pop up and, and there's opportunities there. So um, we would love to help you with that. I, I'm I'm here. I can coach some people in our district. So if you want someone to talk to, to ask questions, uh, be in touch with me. But I also want to share uh, something that's on my heart, on my mind, uh, which is a brand new thing that's I mean, I'm filming this in April and it's premiering in May and uh, I don't have anything written down yet, but here's what I want to do. And if you're listening to this and if you're interested in this, please come talk to me um, and let's make this happen together. But I want to do a coaching cohort of uh, eight to 12 people of next gen leaders, youth or children's, or really anyone who wants to uh, learn, wants to grow. And what that commitment would be is coming down to the district office once every other month, we would have a day of training, of fellowship, of connection. Um, and I'll share with you some of the things that I've learned as well. Uh, but also you would be partnered with a coach and you'd get coached once a month uh, for one year. And there would be some amount of cost there, but it would be incredibly cheaper than if you did coaching on your own or sought coaching on your own. But it's something that we as a district want to invest. In. We are investing in coaches for a handful of our church planters, a handful of our uh, ministries that are just in crisis right now. And we see the power of coaching, of coming alongside people and saying, you've got this, you can do it. Right now, the church as a whole is struggling with leadership and, and there's just literally not pastors coming through the pipeline. The pipe is dry. We are in a pastoral <laughs> drought right now. We have had uh, probably half a dozen open church avail church Positions, pastorates yeah. roles, next-gen roles, worship roles that just aren't filled because we don't have leaders coming down. Now, that's starting to shift and change thanks to things like ACLD, um, but we don't want the pastors that we have to get burned out. Uh, so we want to encourage the pastors and leaders with coaching and one coach can make a difference in 12 different churches. Yeah. Um, and so I, we believe in coaching. We want to make this happen. Um, so if you want, are interested in this uh, next gen coaching cohort put on by the district, contact me. And I would love to share with you about that. One other thing I want to shout out that I, I discovered at Life Conference is uh, a website called Leader Treks. Have you heard of yeah. Leader Treks? Yep. Uh, it's awesome. It's a great website. They've got all kinds of curriculum and other things too, but they have this uh, leadership development pamphlet. It's a $2 thing. <coughs> Excuse me. Need more of my Aspire. Thank you for the non uh, sponsorship. Thank you, Aspire, <laughs> for the liquid. Leadertreks.com. They have this, this leadership uh, development pamphlet. Uh, pamphlet and it, it it's it's like a walkway of of skills and abilities to help teach and train and coach your volunteers to be better leaders um, or people who aren't leaders to be leaders um, so I want to give a shout out to those couple of programs youth cartel leader tracks and uh, and our, our hopefully future uh, next gen coaching cohort um, all fantastic stuff. I'm. Thank you for talking with yeah, me, Eric. Absolutely. Uh, any other last send off things? Last chance. Uh, I would say, like you talked about leader treks, it, they put out great stuff. Mm -hmm. I, I get I, we. If you're part of Download Youth Ministry, yeah. mm -hmm. they they send a resource every month through that as well, and it's all leadership stuff. So it's fantastic. Um, yeah. The, when you first talked about this concept of doing this this coaching cohort, I'm like, yes, do it, make it happen. That's fantastic. And what's cool is I think you go through that and 
not only are you getting coached, but you're learning a skill and a tool to use with your volunteers, with your students. Yeah. And again, like I said, when I took those coaching courses, it totally changed how I approached ministry. Yeah. And I, I can talk. We've been talking for a while here. <laughs> yeah. I can talk. I can tell stories. But that helped me to go, I'm going to ask more questions and listen more yeah. in those kind of conversations than just tell, tell, tell. Yeah. And that, that I think as a leader will help you fundamentally change how you approach ministry to yeah. going through something like that. Absolutely. And, and one of my goals for that group would be to help you as a participant discover your personal and ministry values. What matters to you in ministry can help define how you do ministry and where you put your efforts, and that can simplify ministry for you. So that throughout that whole year, we would go through a process of of learning different things, but also having the opportunity for you to dive in to your own self-discovery. Um, my my coach who taught me this uh, would say that the mark of a great leader is self-awareness, and uh, that's very true. So it's an opportunity for you to discover who God has made you to be mm -hmm. and uh, what he wants you to be doing next. So Yeah, sign up for this thing. <laughs> uh, yes, and uh, you can contact me at michael at cmaspa.org. Um, but with that, all of that said, thank you so much, Eric, for being here. My pleasure. Thank you, Aspire Healthy Energy Natural Caffeine Drink, uh, Mango Lemonade in particular. Um, but with that said, uh, until next time, all of Jesus for all the world. Thanks, guys. See you.